so uh, I usually like to do the whole setup. I like to have a script uh, or an outline of whatever I want to talk about. But today, I just kind of want to. I just kind of want to speak off the top of my dome. I'm literally going to sit in my bed. I have a I have a shotgun mic boomed up in front of me. I have a camera right there. I have a TV and a PlayStation 5 and I'm going to play a game and I'm just gonna speak. I don't really know exactly what I'm gonna play. Uh, let's play... You know what? Let's play the game that I wanted to talk about. Let's do it. Let's play Red Dead Redemption 2. <laughs> Future me is gonna have a hell of a time going through all of this and trying to make something coherent out of it, but you know what? It's fine. So, um, Red Dead Redemption 2 means a lot to me. Now, in order to fully understand why, probably have to rewind the clock a little bit, um, back to when I was, uh, when I was fresh out of high school. I had just gone through a really weird breakup and I was uh, about to start going to Marshall University uh, to study video production because it was cheaper than OSU and <laughs> and uh, it was closer and it, you know I wanted to study film and how to make videos and stuff. In the interim between high school and college I was you know I wasn't very happy uh, so not much has changed. Um, I was just kind of alone uh, and I was living with my aunt, you know. She did her best to to console me and make me feel like a person. What ended up happening is I sort of forced myself back into the social and dating uh, ring. And I started reconnecting with this girl that I kind of knew in high school. And we kind of hit it off. And we went on one date. She came to my house and we watched Star Wars. I, I opened the window um, because I thought that this was a cool shot and I let something in and it's buzzing around and I'm not 100% sure what it is. Ugh. I think it's just a fly. And you know, I was, I wasn't ready to start talking to people or dating people again. Uh, and I sort of just jumped right back into it and that was a mistake even though it was well-intentioned and I wasn't trying to be creepy or anything like that or intentionally clingy uh, I definitely was clingy because anytime that she would go a couple hours without texting me I would just I would just keep texting and you know that wasn't the right thing to do <laughs> That was kind of, uh, that was kind of weird. And I think I made her feel uncomfortable and she just stopped talking to me. Find out a, like a couple months later that she moved to Pittsburgh. I doubt that that's related. I doubt that she moved to Pittsburgh to get away from me. Cause you know, while I did make her feel weird, I don't think I made her feel that weird. <laughs> I hope so. I was pretty low. I was pretty low after that. And then the first semester of college began and I started making friends. Like, I started making friends and it was weird, especially after trying to open up and talk to another, like a new person and that failing miserably. Like it, it was, it just kind of happened naturally. When I talk to a lot of my friends um, and we talk about this time, they're always like, yeah, you were really, really weird back then. And I mean, it makes sense because after long periods of social withdrawal, I guess it makes sense for me to be socially awkward. But here we are at the end of our college careers and I am one of the few ones who wasn't weeded out. So I guess that says something. The crowd that I was trying to fit in with in high school, other than like three people who were, who were my true friends, the people that I, were tr I was trying to fit in with, it wasn't working out. It is true, you know, and a lot of people say it, that whenever you 
come to college, you really do find your people. And that was really nice. I was starting, I was commuting at the time. So like I was, and I was starting to spend more time on campus with my friends who lived on campus than I did at home. And it felt really good. I felt like a person and not just a shell like I did all throughout high school. I, I hope that by this point, if you're familiar with the narrative, I'm kind of banking that if you're watching this, you're familiar with the story of Red Dead Redemption 2, that by this point, the parallels that I was seeing when I first played the game with myself and Arthur Morgan aren't too hyperbolic. But what I'm about to get into next definitely is sort of icing on the cake, uh, and it really cements those parallels that I'm trying to evoke. But then, you know, the spring semester ended, summer break started, and something weird happened to me. So for like a week or so, uh, I felt really weak, and I felt really tired all the time. And it all culminated in one night where I woke up in the night to use the bathroom. And I felt so weak, I, I had to pee, and I sat down to pee because I didn't feel like standing. And I tried to get up, and I fell straight onto the bathroom floor with my pants down in a really uh, compromising position. Uh, that was the night that my life kind of changed. My aunt, she came in, she rushed me to the ER. They ruled that it was a case of severe dehydration. So they kept me in the ER for the night. Uh, CAT scan and x-rays, uh, nothing turned up. Blood work, nothing. And they gave me an IV, they hydrated me up, and they sent me on my way. But then the feeling persisted. I had another similar accident, and then I was able to get in for an MRI. And when I was told that I had three, two, two, two lesions, I don't even freaking remember, two lesions on my brain, I didn't know what to make of it. They couldn't quite diagnose me at the time, but the neurologist that I talked to said that it looked like multiple sclerosis, uh, which if you don't know is a disease where the white blood cells in your immune system uh, will just attack parts of your brain because they, they see certain parts of your brain as foreign bodies that need to be fought off. And they will leave little bruises, little boo-boos, little lesions on your brain, uh, which, you know, a lesion is just damaged tissue. Uh, you know, that, that tissue will still work. It just won't work optimally. And the lesions on my brain kind of mostly affect my balance. I have really bad vertigo. And no matter where they are, they kind of do affect your energy levels. They make you feel fatigued. They make you feel tired they they give you less endurance and then i was able to get in for for a, a, a spinal tap and it was official it was relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis which that is the best kind of ms to have definitely because that basically just means if you don't take care of yourself there's a chance of this happening again. It's not gonna get any worse it's not gonna get any better take care of yourself so that you don't end up in that weird uh, place again where you are bedridden and you can't do anything and you need <laughs> assistance to do anything and you can't see and you can't, you can barely talk. Uh, gosh. Needless to say uh, that while ever since that little episode in 2018 when I was first diagnosed, I haven't had an episode like that since. But that is not to say that it has not had a huge impact on my mental well-being. Having this looming threat of that happening to me, like, any time, is one of the scariest things that you can have in the back of your head at all times. 
And you know, MS never really leads to anything more. It never, it's not linked to any sort of, uh, to any sort of other neurological disorders. But that doesn't stop my OCD hyperfixating self from just conjuring up these scenarios in my head where it's like, oh, what if I, what if I end up having this? What if I end up, what if I end up doing that? What if, what if like, just what if, what if, what if? It is it, it, like I'm working on it, but it's exhausting. It's just that the past few years of my life, the big problems that I never sort of paid attention to and neglected have kind of come to the forefront a lot. Like my anxiety, my obsessive compulsive ways, my very much undiagnosed but very present um, ADHD have all kind of come to the forefront. And I feel like my entryway into my 20s was a trial by fire <laughs> that really made me have to realize all the things that I need to fix. If that's not art imitating life, then I really don't know what is. The, the, the fatigue and the physical handicaps that I experience very much do not help with this imposter syndrome that I feel. Because, you know, here I am. I, I want to be a person who, who creates art and advocates for art and analyzes art and, and, and just revolves around it. The feeling of having that over my head and knowing that I'm not capable of all the things that my peers are capable of doesn't stop me. It doesn't stop me. It might slow me down, but it has never stopped me. You know, I'm not going to... Obviously, there's a world of difference between tuberculosis in 1899 and relapsing, remitting MS in 2018. But, like, when I was playing the game and I got to the part where Arthur is actually fully diagnosed with TB and he realizes what he has to do and where his life is headed, I, I, it broke, it broke me. <laughs> but not in a bad way. It broke me in a way that made me realize. It put things into perspective for me. And a lot of that resolve was founded in the media and the art that I was consuming at the time, which was Red Dead Redemption 2. I was seeing all these crazy parallels with myself and this character that I really empathized with and a performance that really grabbed me in a game and an experience that immersed me. And it was just, and it helped me see just how I could go about conquering these obstacles that I saw in my path. And I thank, I thank Rockstar and I thank Sam Hauser and the rest of the writing team and Roger Clark who just <laughs> played the part to perfection. Just a masterful performance. Not to say that any of the other performances in the game are bad because that is far from the truth. <laughs> and I just thank this creative team for helping me, I don't know, find this part of myself. And I think there's something to be said about how Rockstar designed the game in such a way that you have to be with Arthur uh, for every step of the way, like manually picking up every item, cooking every meal, uh, skinning every animal that you hunt, shooting every poor sap that gets in your way. And then later on in the game, after his diagnosis, having to sit with him uh, after he gets exhausted and watching him catch his wheezy coffee breath, like as a person who suffers from a disorder that causes chronic fatigue, there is something really powerful about that. I guess what I want to say is like, if I can come back from 
being bound in a wheelchair, being legally blind, uh, having one of my eyes go lazy, and then magically freaking coming, just, just correcting itself. I don't know how the heck that happened. And not being able to move, not being able to speak, not being able to do anything on my own. If I can come back from that, I believe that anyone is capable of doing anything that they set their mind to. But you know what? You know that you're in the right place in life when you have people around you who will stop at nothing to make sure that you feel comfortable and safe and that you are enough. And all the people that I've indirectly mentioned who have helped me just in any way, uh, you know who you are and I love you and I, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> I'm going to keep playing this game. Because this game makes me feel comfortable. And don't let anyone discourage you from wanting to immerse yourself into an experience that makes you feel comfortable and something that is familiar. Because it helps. It helps you get inspired. It helps you motivate yourself. And it helps you feel comfortable, which is the most important thing. Anyway, bye.